Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, very happy to have uh, Daniel Wicks uh, visiting from NYU. Um, he's a graduate student, uh, student of Evgeny Dodis, and he will soon go to IBM as a Joseph Raviv Memorial Postdoc, very prestigious uh, position. <laughs> uh, uh, so, and he'll talk about uh, separating um, succinct non-interactive arguments from all falsifiable assumptions today. Okay. Hi, thanks. So, uh, this joint work with Craig Gentry. And uh, so here's a picture of a non-interactive argument. Um, and so, you know, I don't have any experience with this sort of thing. I'm lucky, but from what when my friends tell me, it turns out that it's, it, it seems to be a very hard problem whether these can be made more succinct or shorter. And so uh, this talk will be about formalizing why, why this is so hard. Hmm? Is that you know? No. <laughs> it's a Google image or something. So. Uh, uh, so what do people argue about? Well, we have some language L. This is kind of the set of uh, all statements that we believe are true. And we want to convince someone that a statement X is in the language. And so we, we know that NP is really the class of languages for which we have uh, non-interactive proofs with an efficient verifier. So sometimes these are also called witnesses. So if I want to convince that something is in an NP language, I can always give a witness and the person is convinced that the statement is true and can check it efficiently. So the question for this talk is, uh, how succinctly can we argue membership on, uh, in NP languages? And it turns out that if you think about uh, kind of arguing membership as being the regular kind of NP witnesses, then, it can't, then these type of witnesses can't actually be too short. And the reason is because you can decide membership just by trying every possible witness. So uh, in particular, that means if, if the witness size was sublinear in the statement size, then you could decide any, any problem in NP in sub-exponential time, which we don't believe to be likely. So, and this actually even generalizes to interactive proofs. So even in interactive proofs, the communication can't be uh, too short. So N is what? N is the length of the statement? Yeah. Yeah. So, so even interactive proofs can't be, can be too short. But uh, the work of uh, Killian and Mikali from the 90s showed that you might be able to get short arguments if you weaken the notion of soundness, so, we, uh, so they looked at computationally sound proofs, uh, or in the rest of the talk when I say arguments, that's what I mean, computationally sound proofs. And this means that it might be possible, uh, if you're unbounded time, you might be able to, uh, to prove false statements, but if you're efficient, then, then you cannot. So efficient people can only prove true statements, they can't find arguments for false statements. Uh, on the other hand, we also want that if, uh, if kind of people are honest, they should be able to prove statements efficiently as long as they have kind of the standard type of uh, NP witness. So if you have an NP witness, you can, you can compute uh, arguments. And, uh, and uh, when, I, when I say succinct, the question is whether we can make these arguments, the size of these arguments or the communication, to be just polynomial, some fixed polynomial in the security para parameter and polylogarithmic in the instance and witness size. So another way to think about this bound is that it's actually, you know, if the statement and witness are, let's say, less than two to the security parameter, then this is just some, also some fixed polynomial in the security parameter. So that means that the size of the, of the argument is a fixed polynomial in the security parameter, no matter how big of a polynomial kind of instance and witness you want to use. So that's really the question. Can we have a fixed polynomial bound on the size of the arguments? No, oh, I do. I mean, I'm counting. Uh, what I mean is, uh, verifier knows X. Verifier knows the statement, right? Uh, that's true, but... Right. So, so, I mean, so the verifier will know oh, this is long, but the proof is short. Proof. Yeah, yeah, the proof should, should still be shorter than the statement. <coughs> so I, I'm... Right. Um, so what do we know? Well, we know that we can actually get arguments like this that are interactive, so using four rounds of interaction, just assuming that collision resistant hash functions exist. That's a result of Killian from 92. And we can even make them non-interactive, but only uh, as far as we know, in the ran only in the random Oracle model. And that's uh, Mikali's result from 94. And so the question is, can we get these succinct non-interactive arguments in the standard model? And I'll call them uh, snarks for short, because it sounds funny. Uh, so, um, uh, so that's how I'll call them. 
So there's a problem, and the problem is that uh, the answer is no in at least one sense, which is that there's always uh, a small adversary or non-uniform adversary that for every level of the security parameter has a hard-coded false statement and a verifying proof for it. So this is uh, really the same reason that collision resistant, that unkeyed collision resistant hash functions don't exist, right? Because you can always have a hard-coded collision. And of course, we don't throw up our hands and say collision resistant hash functions don't exist. We just uh, uh, talk about collision resistant hash functions that have some parameters or some kind of key. And we'll do the same exact thing for SNARK. So when I talk about non-interactive arguments, I'll, I'll be talking about them with some common parameters. Here I'll call them a common reference strength. Okay. So the question is if these types of... Uh, Why would this be hard codes? Because you're saying that there, there will always exist a, a verifying proof for a false uh, statement. If you, under some assumptions. Like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so unless you can do it unconditionally, there will always be a verifying proof for a false statement. So, uh, so well, do, do these type of snarks exist? So, we, well, we have some positive evidence because we can take uh, Michaeli's construction from the random oracle model and replace the random oracle with some complicated hash function and just assume that it's secure. And the CRS will be the description of the hash function. And, well, what can we say about it? I don't know how to break it, so we can conjecture that it's secure, but we really can't say much else. So that's not really very satisfying for cryptographers. So can we actually come up with a construction that we can prove secure under some real assumption, like that one-way functions exist, or DDH, or something like that. Uh, or maybe these assumptions are too nice. Can we prove it under some interactive assumption, like one more discrete log, or some funny-sounding assumption, like Q-decisional augmented bilinear Diffie-Hellman exponent assumption, making, I'm picking my co-author here. It's an <laughs> assumption he defined. Um, so, hmm? This is all recorded and public. Oh, yeah. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so the answer that we give in this work is, is actually a negative answer. We show that no, you, can't, you, you really can't prove it under these assumptions, under these nice assumptions that you'd want to prove it un under. Of course, there's some restrictions. So here's the, the more formal result. So we show that there's no black box reduction proof of security for any, any SNARK construction under any of these assumptions from the last slide, even kind of the weirder ones. Uh, in fact, the larger class of assumptions that's, that I'll call falsifiable assumptions. All right, so in order to explain this, I have to explain what all these things are. What's a, a black box reduction is a type of proof technique, so I have to explain what that is and what falsifiable assumptions are. Before I do that, let me actually focus a little more what the definition of security for SNARKs is, just to be a little more formal about it. So for SNARK, we have, two, we have three algorithms. We have uh, a generation algorithm that creates the CRS, depending on secure parameter. We have a prover that uh, gets a statement of witness, generates a proof, and a verifier that tries to verify. And completeness is just a regular thing, that if the statement is true, the witness is good, then these, these arguments pi will, will verify as well. And uh, so soundness is a little more complicated. So here the attacker actually sees the CRS first, then gets to choose uh, a statement and a proof. And he wins if the statement is fall, uh, false and the proof verifies. So the only subtlety here is that I'm talking about adaptive soundness, that attacker first sees the CRS, then gets to choose uh, the false statement that he wants to prove. And that's what you want from a non-interactive argument because the CRS is fixed in the sky, the attacker can kind of adaptively try to choose a false statement. Um, uh, so you could think of weaker notions and because there's a negative result, it's good to get us to prove a negative result for as weak of a notion as possible. So one is, uh, we could talk about designated verifier snarks where uh, the, there's also a secret key generated along with the CRS and the verifier needs a secret key to verify. And uh, another weakening we could talk about is static soundness, that the attacker first chooses the statement and then, uh, before seeing the CRS, and then, then gets a random CRS. So you can't choose it adaptively. And it turns out that all of the results in this talk will actually also apply to designated verifier snarks, but uh, we don't know about static soundness. So we, we crucially rely on adaptive soundness. And I just wanted to mention that Really, if you have a snark with static soundness, it's the same thing as a two-round argument system because you can think of the CRs as a first round and as the response as a second round. So really, the only distinction between non-interactive and two-round is that for non-interactive, you want adaptive soundness because you think of the CRs as being published once in the sky and the attacker then uh, kind of you keep using it afterwards. Non-interactive and public coin. Uh, yes, uh, unless you have, well, we also talk about designated verifiers, so then it would be two-round. So yeah, let me just draw the map. 
So here we have the various notions from strongest to weakest. So uh, while well, snarks without SCRs, we know they don't exist, at least for non-uniform attackers. Uh, for publicly verifiable and designated verifier snarks with adaptive soundness, that's exactly where our results are coming in. So we believe they exist, but we can't prove them secure under this kind of normal assumptions. And for two round and three round arguments with static soundness, we actually don't know anything. So that's, that's an open question. And uh, four rounds, we already have Killian's results. So assuming collision resistant hash functions, these exist. So that's, that's the map. Well, we know three rounds with CRS, right? Yes, that's the same. Yeah, right. So, all right, so the next thing I'll talk about is what a falsifiable, what's the class of assumptions that we're separating from? Um, so falsifiable assumptions were first defined by Naur, and this isn't the exact definition that he used, it's kind of in the same spirit. It's maybe a little broader, which is better for our negative result. So uh, a falsifiable assumption is actually just any assumption that you can describe as a game between an efficient interactive challenger. So the assumption, the description of the assumption is just the description of this challenger. And the assumption says that, um, and that this challenger plays a game against an adversary and efficiently decides whether the adversary wins or not. So the challenger decides that and can do it efficiently. And the assumption says that for any polynomial time adversary, the problem of winning is, it should be negligible. Or maybe for decisional assumptions, it can also do one half plus negligible. And uh, so this really models things like discrete log where the challenger you know, chooses a random, random uh, exponent x and sends you a group element g to the x power and decides whether you win or not, just depending whether you send back x or not. Um, and it really models pretty much anything you could think of, DDH, RSA, LWE, uh, learning with errors, even kind of these interactive assumptions like one more discrete log uh, that, that's modeled as well. The challenger can be interactive. What is one more discrete log? Uh, so it, it's not really informed, but okay. yeah. It's what you can prove the Schnorr protocol under, I think. <laughs> so, okay. But uh, there are some things that aren't falsifiable. So an, an important example for this talk is actually if you take some construction of a snark, let's say Michali's construction where you place the random oracle with, a, with some complicated hash function, and assume that it's secure. This is an assumption. Now I can write this as a game between a challenger and an attacker, but the challenger is inefficient. The reason is that the attacker wins if he produces a false statement and a verifying proof, and there's no way for the challenger to decide whether the statement is true or false. There are other things like knowledge of exponent assumption, which I can't even write down as a game between an attacker and a challenger. It requires some extractability uh, property. So uh, if you don't know what that is, it's, it's not really important. You can make assumptions that aren't falsifiable under this de definition, that don't meet this definition. It's also not, not as, if you take some proof system, assume it's a proof of knowledge, it's also, it's, it's not written syntactically. It's not a game between attacker and challenger. Yeah, so I mean, well, the definition requires the existence of some extractor and things like that. It's not really syntactically game. When you say it, the game has to exclude like these, uh, these extractors, then because you could just have a game that includes the extractor built into it. Right? Uh, no, because so the chat non black box dependency on the adversary. Then or? well. Th I mean, the definition of, let's say, knowledge of exponent isn't there's a challenger that tests you and figures out whether you win. It says for every attacker, it, it, there's more quantifiers, right? It says for every attacker there exists an extractor right, such so that this I'm happens. Saying, like, the quantifiers are different. You can have the extractor. If it's a universal extractor, it can be part of the game, right? And as long as it's efficient, then, uh, then it seems like it fits in this definition. It's, uh, can I check if I was that I was going to say? So, well, it's not like the challenger play. You know, the cha in order to run the extractor, you need non-black box access to the attacker. You're not just interacting. So here, the chat. There's a game where the challenger is an interactive Turing machine. It's sending challenges, okay. getting responses, okay. and that that's not what knowledge of exponent would be. Yeah, okay. no, but I mean, for some things, there are universal extractors. For example, I mean, for some definitions, well, let's say there are no more because you define extractor given the oracle calls that the attacker makes, and if you implement there are no more you can do it, but even for those things, you still can't do it. Well, you can, you can come up with non-falsifiable assumptions, like that some argument system is, is uh, proof of knowledge. It's not, we, it's not, it doesn't syntactically match this definition, but you can prove them under falsifiable assumptions, like that one-way functions exist. No, no, That's not excluded here. A priori, I could imagine some kind of proof of knowledge assumption with universal extractor. My question is, it seems to me, even this 
so so the extractor could push could be pushed. Well, you, usually it requires rewinding or something, right? No, no, but forget about rewinding. I mean, some who assume the game decides that you're kind of doing that just gives some kind of proof or whatever. Then you run extractor, and if the extractor fails, yeah, yeah, the statement then is that will be falsifiable. No, it's not falsifiable because it's a statement. You need to check the statement is false. Oh, I see. So it has to produce a false statement with the proof. So you run the extractor, it fails. How do you know it's a false statement? Right? Right so I didn't know there was a statement. Okay, well, I, I don't know what the def. But yeah, All right, yeah, no, you can come with def with assumptions that don't match this. I guess that's the that's the point. But. What is the famous example of something which is a priori has a zero falsifiable, but you can build them from non-falsifiable assumptions? Well, let's say zero knowledge, you know, zero knowledge proves knowledge, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, um, so the last thing I want to talk about is what, what's the you know this this statement is about a specific type of proof technique that can be used to show uh, to show security. So, what's this proof technique? What's the black box reduction? So, uh, normally we want to prove that under some assumption, like let's say that discrete log is hard, we we build a snark and we want to prove that it's secure under this assumption. And the way we usually do it is via a contrapositive. So, if there's an attack on the on the snark, or snark attack, if you will then uh, that should imply an attack on the assumption. Um, and uh, a black box reduction is just a, a, a constructive proof of this, a, a special type of constructive proof where we actually build a, an efficient Oracle access algorithm that we call a reduction. This, this reduction gets access, Oracle access to the attacker and using, using this it should break the assumption, it should win, win this game with the challenger. Okay, so the reduction is just a, an efficient Oracle access machine. It can talk the, the, the Oracle it accesses, the attacker could be efficient or inefficient. It doesn't matter. It should, it should win as long as the attacker is a good attacker. So even it should actually win this assumption, it should break this assumption, even if the attacker that it talks to is an inefficient guy, uh, as long as, as it's a successful attacker. That's, that's really the property that you want from a reduction. And this kind of captures the fact that we don't know how to, how to talk, reason about attackers being efficient or inefficient other than just kind of running them and, and calling them in, as, as a black box. And then um, if, if the guy is efficient, then the reduction is efficient as well. Then, then the reduction together with the attack are efficient as well. Uh, and uh, so sometimes for reductions you also have to uh, talk about rewinding. Uh, that's, uh, uh, but here, uh, because we can, uh, this is kind of a, a two-round uh, uh, um, a game between the attacker and the, ch and the and, uh, for the snark attack, he just gets a CRS and he should output a statement approved. There, you can assume that the attacker is stateless, so you don't have to worry about rewinding. So it's really, you can just talk about Oracle access. Okay, so now we, have, uh, now we have all the tools we need to kind of understand this result. So there's two caveats that I, that I want to mention. So first, uh, first, I have to assume that the falsifiable assumption isn't actually false. It's very easy to prove things under false, assumption, uh, uh, false assumptions, right? So, uh, so that's one thing. And the other one is that um, snarks actually could exist unconditionally if p is equal to np. So I need to make some hardness assumption as well. And uh, I'll actually need to assume that sub I'll, I'll assume that sub exponentially hard one way functions exist. That'll be the assumption here. So, so it's not strictly necessary. Right? It's not strictly necessary. You, you say that if there is a snark for, uh, for a language, then it's uh, not an. Uh, so, so I'm talking about snarks for all of NP, let's say. So uh, in order to. Right? So, so in order to show. Uh, if p is equal to np, let's say that snarks for all of np exists, even if all of np has polylogarithmic witnesses, which yes. is not a priori. Yes. So I need to make some, some assumption along these sides. This is not necessarily the minimal assumption. No, but it's right. Yeah. It doesn't. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to just, uh, ju just restate the result uh, in a little nicer way. So assume you do have a snark construction, you do have a black box reduction proof of security for it under some falsifiable assumption, then one of these two things must hold. Either the assumption is already false, you right away get an attack on it using your reduction, or just, so that would be kind of a trivial statement, or sub exponentially hard one-way functions don't exist, which we, you know, we, we believe they do, so uh, that would be unlikely. Okay, so let's talk about the proof technique. So the, proof te the, the main idea of proof technique is to show a special type of attack that I'll call a simulatable attack. So a simulatable attack is a, is a special type of attack against, uh, against a snark. So you, know, you give me a, snark, uh, a construction of a snark, a proposed construction, I should come up with this attack. And it's always easy to come up with inefficient attacks, so this isn't surprising, but uh, it's a special type of attack. So, um, uh, and what's special about it is that there also exists a simulator, 
which is efficient, and no distinguisher can tell the attacker from the simulator. So there's an attack that's inefficient, it outputs false statements and valid proofs, it runs in exponential time. There's a simulator that's efficient and kind of looks the same to, to any bounded party. And uh, so this is a weird thing. Like you're not going to get a simulatable attack, let's say against an encryption scheme, without you already getting a, a real attack against, a, a real efficient attack against an encryption scheme. Because, uh, well, if the inefficient attacker, if there's an attack that breaks the encryption scheme and there's a simulator, the simulator better break it as well. But this is exactly not true for snarks or for assumptions that aren't falsifiable because you might, uh, because you might not be able to tell whether you're breaking the scheme or not. Exactly. So in fact, the efficient simulator here will output true statements and valid proofs. And you can't tell the difference because you can't tell whether the statements are true or false. So that's really the, the main idea of, of the proof. So uh, I just need to show two things. So first I need to show that if you do have a simulatable attack, if you have this special type of thing, then th there's a black box separation. You won't be able to prove security in a black box reduction. And then I need to show that every snark construction comes with the simulatable attack. So the second part will be easier. So let's start with that. So here, um, assume that there is this special type of simulatable attack and we have a, a reduction that breaks the assumption. Well, so remember this attack is inefficient. So right now this kind of box over here is an inefficient attack against the assumption. So it's not very interesting. But, um, oh, and yeah, the assumption challenger here, uh, here uh, says that this attack is good. But uh, we can always think of the reduction and the assumption together as one efficient machine because both of these are efficient, and that's, here's the only place where we use that the assumption is falsifiable, right? Otherwise, if it wasn't falsifiable, this wouldn't be, this wouldn't be the case. And so, uh, so this, this is one efficient machine, and so we can replace the attacker with a simulator, and still we'll get the same outcome. And now, uh, if we lump the reduction and the simulator together, it means they are actually an efficient attack against the assumption. So this is kind of, let's say, a discrete log assumption. So this guy sends you g to the x. Then here you will have an efficient attack that computes x from g to the x. So this is the only place you use the fact that the assumption is true. I mean, the assumption is not false. Right, right, okay. yeah. So, um, right, so if there's a re black box reduction to this assumption and you have a simulatable snark attack, then the assumption is false. That's what we derived right now. So, yeah, it's exactly what it says here. So, of course, you know, we assume that we have the simulatable attack. So that's what we have to prove now, that every snark construction has a simulatable attack. Okay? So, uh, well, here this statement is actually not true unless I make an assumption. Why is that? Because we could have unconditionally secure snarks if p is equal to np, so there would be no attack against them, right? So here, in order to show that there exists a simulatable attack, I need to make some assumption. So here I'll make the assumption um, uh, right. So uh, here's my sub-exponential hardness assumption. It'll reduce to one-way functions. But I'll assume that there exists an NP language L and two distributions, one over the statements in the language and one over statements outside. So I'll call them the good distribution and the bad distribution. And, uh, and these two distributions should be indistinguishable. Okay? And I'll furthermore one, uh, assume that you can actually sample statements from the good distribution along with a witness. Okay, so this you actually get by PRG. So if you think, uh, if you look at pseudorandom generators, you can say the good distribution are pseudorandom strings, the bad distribution is random strings, and these two are indistinguishable. And that's implied by one-way functions. Why is the sub-exponential? Say that again? Where does the sub-exponential come in? Well, uh, that's what I'm assuming. Yeah, I'm assuming a sub-exponential indistinguishability here. Uh, yeah. Okay, so let's kind of fix this. Uh, so let's actually fix this particular hard language, L. And uh, what I'm going to show is that uh, any snark for this language will have a simulatable attack, which means that any snark for all of NP will as well, because it'll Im imply one for this language. Okay. So, uh, so that's what we need to show. So, well, what, what are, so in order to show a simulatable attack, we need to give these two, uh, two machines or two entities, the attacker, that's inefficient and the simulator that's efficient but looks the same. So what should they do? Well, they're gonna have to produce some, some statements so the, it's kind of clear that... Uh -huh. so, so you're 
stuff doesn't rule out the, the, the following thing, right? I mean, there could be a class of large subclass of NP, which could have uh, snubs. For example, P. Right, but I yeah, yeah, yeah. talking about something more. Yeah, yeah, it, it doesn't, but it, it, it says that there will be no snarks for any language which has, sub, which has these indistinguishability problem, which has a hard problem, indistinguishable problem on it. Yeah. Because they kind of conceivably have weaknesses for language. Uh, but, it, you, I mean, you could, you could, so I don't know what, what's known about having sub-exponentially hard pseudorandom generators in oh, but P, for example, in your case, and, uh, and P intersect cohen P. It seems reasonable, though, so I, I, I would think. Oh, I see, so, yeah. So, 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 so any subclubs which has sub exponential hard pseudorandom generators in it, well, you, you'll show that snarks but don't yes, exist. Yes, you're saying that you produce true statements, the other guy produces false statements, you're saying, even though false statements have weaknesses, I guess the snark is not allowed, is not required to produce a weakness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, that's... Yeah. yeah. Right. So the snark attack will produce uh, the, the false statements or the state the bad from the bad distribution. The simulator will do will produce ones from the good distribution along with a witness. And it's also clear the simulator will actually do the honest thing. It'll just run the proving algorithm to produce the the argument pi. But now, what does the attacker do? Well. He kind of needs to find a, 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 a verifying argument, and he can do this using brute force. But it's actually, this is actually somewhat non-trivial. So you could think a naive idea would be just to try all possible arguments until one verifies and maybe output the first one that does when you, when you sample a bad statement. But the problem is the one you, you sample might, might not look anything at all like the correct distribution that's produced uh, using this, this kind of, uh, by sampling good statements and actually running the proving algorithm. So in, in, in a, uh, what I'm saying is that finding a, an argument that verifies is not the same as finding an argument that's indistinguishable from the ones that are produced by, by the actual, by the honest algorithm. So what, what does it mean? What should the attacker actually do to produce something that's indistinguishable, that you can't tell apart? That's really the question here. And, you know. What are you trying to do? So, so, okay, so, so remember, the, the, I, I need to build an attacker and a simulator that output essentially the same distribution, so that... Given an attacker, you have to build a simulator. Well, no, no, no. I need to build a special attacker and a special simulator okay. together. I, not for any attacker. I, I'm, I'm constructing okay, the attacker. So my, I'm actually, yeah, so here I'm saying both the attacker and simulator will just kind of sample, sample statements, one from the bad language, one from the good language. Yeah. And the simulator, it's kind of clear he should also actually use the correct algorithm to generate an argument. Because, uh, but it's not clear a priori what the attacker should do. So the attacker is trying to match the simulator. So here now I'm trying to construct an attacker that matches the simulator, that outputs some distribution on proofs that, match, that looks indistinguishable from the one the simulator uses. But I don't actually a priori know how to do this, right? It's not just trying brute force and outputting the first proof that verifies is not a good strategy might not be a good strategy. I mean, sometimes you could conceivably do it the other way around. The problem is the simulator has to be efficient, so he's kind of stuck with some one thing. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just yeah. Right. Yeah, he, I mean, there is only one thing he can do, so some cool. But the good news is not can be inefficient, but it's still okay. Yeah, exactly. So I, I, I don't need to, so it's not going to be efficient. The, the way of finding these arguments could be arbitrary, but it's not even clear a priori that there exists some inefficient way of doing this. Uh, at least, you know, I don't know what it is. And uh, so I'm actually still not going to show you what it is. I'm going to, it's going to be non-constructive, but I'm going to at least show you that there is a way, that there exists some way of sampling these proofs that, that matches the simulator. So cor correct looking uh, arguments. So here's, here's kind of the basic statement that I really need to show. So I want to say that for ev every, uh, in, in, or that w we will show, so I want to uh, we'll show that for every efficient uh, alg prover algorithm with relatively short output, so here's the, where I'll use that the, the, the uh, size of the output is short, that the, the, the CS proofs, are, the arguments are short, there should exist an, uh, an inefficient uh, way of lying so that if I sample good statements and give you the output of the proof, proof algorithm on them, then it'll be indistinguishable from sampling bad statements and using the lying algorithm, okay? Actually, I'll prove something stronger. I don't care that, that the proving algorithm is, is efficient. It, it, this actually even works if it's inefficient, as long, again, as the output size is short. And uh, if it's inefficient, we don't actually need to 
care about the witness because this proving algorithm can just sample the witness on its own. So, um, so we can erase that. And then it becomes uh, kind of a nice, maybe on its own statement about, the, uh, about some indistinguishable property with auxiliary information. So what I'm really showing is that for any two distributions that are indistinguishable, if I have some extra auxiliary information that I tell you about samples from, from the first distribution, from the good distribution, let's say, uh, that could be completely inefficient. So it's inefficiently produced auxiliary information I can't generate it myself. There exists a way of lying about samples from the other distributions so that the joint distributions still look indistinguishable. Okay. Um, of course, uh, this isn't really true if, uh, well, I need to talk about why this, what does it mean that it's short. So the security here goes down by a fact that's, polyno that's exponential in the size of the auxiliary information. That's necessary. If I give you a, if I give you a pseudorandom string and I give you the seed, uh, you, know, you know it's pseudorandom. I can't match it by giving you a uniform string and, and some lie, right? Because uniform strings don't have seeds that, uh, from, a, from a VRG that will match them. So this is, it's really important that the amount of information I'm giving you is not too large. Um, okay, and so uh, I think we have time. So uh, I'll actually go into the proof. Uh, so the proof is, is somewhat similar to Nissan's proof of Impagliazzo's Harcor, uh, Harcor lemma, uses the min-max argument. Um, so I think it's interesting. I think this is kind of a, an interesting the theorem on its own. It should have some other applications. So for example, it seems very related to a theorem of, uh, that, of Zimbabwe and Pietrzak that shows that if you have a pseudorandom generator and you get leakage on a seed, the Hill entropy of the output goes down by the size of the leakage. Because here, it says that you can think of this auxiliary information as leakage, let's say on the seed of a pseudorandom generator. It says that seeing the pseudorandom string, the output of the generator, and leakage on the seed looks like seeing a random string and some short amount of extra information about that. So that's what this theorem would say. Uh, it's not exactly the same. There's technical reasons why these statements aren't the same, but it has a similar feel. Okay, so, uh, so how do we prove this? Well, let's prove the counterpositive. Let's assume otherwise. So what we're assuming is there exists some auxiliary information that I can give you about the one distribution, the good distribution, such that for every attempt of lying, every, uh, every attempt to emulate it, there exists a distinguisher of relatively small size which can distinguish with good probability. Okay, so this is the assumption that we have. And what we want to show is that if this is true, then we can distinguish the good and bad distributions just on their own. And um, there's, there's kind of two problems or two difficulties in proving this, right? So first off, right now we have some distinguishers that require both a statement and some auxiliary information. And we want to have a distinguisher that just gets the samples x, right? Doesn't get any pi. And the second problem is that right now there's, there's kind of the wrong order of quantifiers. So we have a distinguisher for every attempt to lie. We don't have some one universal distinguisher that we can use. So it's not clear how to do this. So the first, uh, the first part of the proof is to try to switch the order of quantifiers using min-max theorem. Um, and so we can do that by essentially interpreting this as a game between two players, a minimizing player and a maximizing player. So the minimizing player is trying to come up with a lie, and the maximizing player is trying to come with a distinguisher that, that has the best chance of distinguishing, right? So the minimizing player is trying to come with a lie for which the distinguisher has the least chance of succeeding, and the, dis the maximizing player is come to, co trying to come with the best possible distinguisher. What is lie? Lie is a Turing machine? Say again? Lie is an algorithm? Uh, yeah, uh, it, any function. I mean, it doesn't, you know, I, I don't care really if it's Turing okay. computer or anything like that. But not size or anything. No, no, no. It's, yeah, it can be arbitrary. Yeah, so, so the distinguisher is a bounded size. That's the only thing. That. So, of course, to use min-max, we, need, we actually need uh, to talk about distributions, uh, right? The, the player should be able to choose randomized, kind of uh, 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 randomized, uh, um, uh, or make randomized moves. So, uh, well, so we need to talk about distributions over distinguishers. Okay, so that's kind of a technical point. I'll mostly ignore that. The lying algorithm is already, you know, having a distribution over, over probabilistic algorithm is just another probabilistic algorithm, so that doesn't matter. So now that we have that, we can apply the min-max theorem and reverse the order of quantifiers. So it's Mr. Von Neumann over here. Um, 
and now we get we get the other. So now we have now we have one family or or a distribution of distinguishers that can distinct such a random one from this class can distinguish every possible i. It's, it's, it's not one distinguisher. It's a distribu It's not an and it's not necessarily an efficiently sampleable distribution of distinguishers. So there's some distribution on efficient distinguishers. The, the distinguishers are all small, but the I might not be able to sample from this distribution. Uh, all right, we'll get to this in a sec. So, um, so just to rewrite this, that says that, uh, yeah, that there exists some auxiliary information, some distribution distinguisher, such that for every attempt to lie, I can, the distinguishers will win. They'll actually tell the difference. So now the next thing we need to do is uh, get rid of this auxiliary information because we want a class of distinguishers that, doesn't, does, that only gets x. So how do we do that? Well, uh, I want to define the following, uh, following value of x, following function of x. It's essentially the, uh, it's kind of what, what the problem the distinguisher will say that the statement is a bad statement if I give it the best possible i. Okay, so this is the, so the best possible i is the is the auxiliary is, is the value pi which will make the distinguisher output one with the least probability. Is this distinguisher mean distinguisher sample? Yes, this over the coin right. for example. Yeah, so this probability is only over uh, D, right? So you fix the D. No, no, no. The probability is over D. O over the this over the distinguishers from this distribution. Right? So this is exactly kind of this this is exactly the the pi that the, that the line distribution should give if it wants to get the smallest, uh, smallest value, right? So essentially then this, this inequality over here says that there's a difference between the expected value of, of x from the bad distribution and the good distribution, okay? That's, so that's exactly what we have. So now we have some one kind of function of x that's different, that's, that, that's different between, between the two distributions. So it seems like this gives us a way to test. So, I mean, I understand the live loop is optimal. Why do we know that the green guy is optimal? Uh, well, it's not because th so this, so I'm subtracting a smaller value than this, right? So here I have some particular distribution aux, but I'm, and I'm subtracting this probability out. If I subtract out even kind of a, a, a worse one, right? I'll get a better advantage. Does that make sense? Yeah, this is right. So I'm subtracting a smaller guy. Oh yeah, sorry, that should be epsilon. Oh, typo. Yeah, change epsilon star stuff. Epsilon. Sorry about that. Uh, right. So now we have a specific kind of value or function of x that that seems to be different between the two distributions. So, so the right strategy seems to be to test. Uh, to kind of try to come up with an estimate for this. And if we come up with a good enough estimate, then we can test whether x is in the good distribution or the bad distribution. Yeah, sorry, yes, last minute changes. So sorry, val is val min, so I'm gonna try to come up with an estimate for that. And to do that, uh, we'll just try all possible values of, uh, uh, so we'll get x, we'll try all possible values of, of the argument pi, and just try, run many distinguishers on this, okay? And we'll try to estimate what the probability they'll output one is, and then, uh, depending on that, we'll we'll decide whether it's in the good set or the bad set. And with d by d, you mean again, uh, the right. R choose many distinguishers from the distribution and run them. So now there's a problem in that. So we, now we actually have uh, uh, an algorithm that distinguishes good, uh, the good and bad distributions, but it needs to sample from this uh, from some distribution of distinguishers. That's where each distinguisher is efficient, but the di sampling from this distribution is inefficient. So this is a problem, but of course, uh, this is kind of all non-uniform stuff, so we can just fix the coins, the best coins of this, of, of this algorithm, and now we get a fixed uh, algorithm that just has some fixed uh, uh, dist efficient distinguishers from this distribution and works well. So by fixing the coins, we actually get a real efficient algorithm. How many points is that one of that Yeah. Um, okay, and so that gives us that gives us a, so that actually finishes the proof that shows that now if uh, now now this gives us a way of distinguishing the original distributions on their own without any auxiliary information. Well, what, what is the regime of epsilon? Just non-negligible or 
Okay. Right. So, so, so the state. Well, so, so the statement is: if you have, uh, uh, if you have distinguishers that run in time s and epsilon, then the size of the distinguisher grows by one. Of, yeah. The security loss is proportional to one over epsilon, and and the size of the and the and the exponential in the proof size that that kills you more. Um, I wasn't actually planning on it, but uh, yeah. The point is that, yeah. The point is you can always get if you assume sub-exponential hardness, you can always choose statements long enough so that the hardness is bigger and and the proof size is fixed, a fixed polynomial. You can always choose the statement size big enough that it overcomes uh, that the hardness of distinguishing these two statements is much bigger than exponential in the proof size. So that's that's really all all I need here. Yeah, I wasn't going to talk about the parameters too much. Just give the, the idea. Uh, yeah, no, so, okay, so that's where the parameters come. So the complexity is uh, exponential in the proof size and, and one, that should probably be a one over epsilon. Yeah. Good. So, uh, so that gives us a strategy for what the attacker should do. It's not, we don't know what the strategy is, but it exists. So now we, we've shown that there exists this attacker and a simulator. Hmm? Yeah. Exactly. So now we've shown that there, that, that there exists this attacker and simulator where the attacker is, uh, is doing the bad thing, prove, giving false statements and proofs, and the simulator is giving true statements and true proofs, and you can't tell them apart. Um, there's a couple of subtleties. So, you know, we only talked about distinguishers that just get one sample from this distribution, but really the distinguisher can call the attacker many times. Um, yeah, you just do, do a hybrid argument. That's relatively easy. Um, so there's another subtlety where I don't even know uh, where the distinguisher can call the oracle with kind of smaller values of the security parameters. So you can give it give him a very small CRS, and then he'll get maybe very small statements and proofs, and those you can distinguish. So you can. So we have this attacker that works for kind of all all sizes, right? All security parameters, and you can call him on anything you want uh, if you're an oracle that's trying to distinguish. So you can call him on purposefully small things to try, and then you can run in enough time to actually figure out whether the statement he's giving you are bad or good. And uh, so this, this is a little bit messy. This actually raises a lot of subtleties that the paper handles. Um, the, the fix is that the simulator, if, if the simulator sometimes also gives false statements if the, if the values are small enough. So uh, I don't want to get too much. Hmm? Yeah, exactly, by just, by just uh, doing brute force in polynomial time. Yeah. You can. It turns out you can make it work. It's a, It's pretty messy. So that's. Uh, I'll. I'll warn you. Um, I've been told that actually a lot of times people do these black box operations. They don't really consider the, this subtlety. Apparently, comes up a lot in black box operations, and often people don't kind of ignore it. But uh, it's a, it seems to be an important thing. But I, I don't know. Um, it's usually you can overcome it with some tricks along this line. Uh, that, that's what I was wondering, but I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, okay. So, yeah, so that, that really just finishes the proof. So, um, so just to get back to, to the main result, so show that if there's a black box reduction under, uh, for some snark constructions under some falsifiable assumptions, then either uh, we have a simulatable attack on this assumption and therefore on this, uh, on this snark, and therefore the falsifiable assumption is just false. Or if no simulatable attack, uh, if the simulatable attacks don't exist, it means that there are no sub-exponentially hard one-way functions. And uh, think of two extensions. So first, uh, we defined succinct to be uh, pretty strictly. We said that the, st the, the argument size is polylogarithmic in the instance and witness. You could ask, well, what about sublinear arguments? And uh, yeah, you can actually, the same, the same separation goes through. Uh, you just need to make a slightly stronger assumption. So before it was sub-exponentially hard one-way functions or subset membership problems. Now you need to talk about exponentially hard ones. Um, okay. And um, so I want to compare a little bit to other black box separations. So this area of black box separation has a long history, starting with Impagliazzo and Rudrich. Um, and uh, or, um, and um, in, in, all, in mo most of the kind of prior work, uh, the way that the black box operation worked is that they showed that you can't construct a primitive A using a generic version of primitive B as a black box. So for example, you can't construct key agreement 
if you get some generic one-way permutation and you don't know anything about it. But of course, you can construct the agreement from specific one-way permutations like RSA, right? So, uh, so, so it talked about really the structure of the construction using some primitive, some generic primitive as a black box. Uh, so here, the result, our result is somewhat different because the construction can be arbitrary. We don't care about how the snark construction works. We don't even talk about any generic primitives like generic one-way permutation. We talk about specific assumptions like RSA or DDH. And uh, so, the, the, uh, so the black box separation here is that uh, the attacker, uh, or what's black box here is that the reduction uses the attacker as a black box. So it's, it's, it's a restriction not on the construction, but on the proof technique. Okay. Um, and so that might actually be, in some sense, that might be harder to get around because we, we do have ways of using primitives as an, uh, in a non-black box way, like proving zero knowledge, uh, using zero knowledge proofs on them, things like that. We don't really have too many ways of using attackers in a non-black box way. So uh, maybe Barak's result, arguably, is of this form. Uh, right. Yeah. No, that's, well, yeah. No, that's exactly it. Um, Exactly from the exponent, right? I mean, yeah. Yes, growth. Yeah, I was going to mention it. Yeah, that's, uh, I think. Wow. All right. Uh, so yeah. Um, so we saw. Uh, so we saw the result. And um, so here's. Uh, there's a couple of interesting open problems. So the first one is, uh, can you use non-black box techniques? Again, that seems to be difficult. We really don't have, don't have much. Uh, really don't have any anything that that, that we know how to throw at it. Um, so the other thing is, can you build snogs under non-falsifiable assumptions like knowledge of exponent? And yeah, in fact, the answer is yes, under fairly strong versions of knowledge of exponents and bilinear groups. Uh, so definitely this doesn't fit into your, non, in your falsifiable yeah. category. And yeah. Why exactly? Because the, because the knowledge of exponent assumption they state needs to be non-black box on the average term. I mean, every knowledge of exponent assumption I know is, is not falsifiable. Yeah, you could just make a stronger assumption there's an existing universal like uh, extractor though, right? Um, I don't know, we will talk about it. Later. Yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. yeah. I don't think that works? No, I don't think so. I mean, the universal extractor has to get something. It, it has to get the code of the attacker or something. It's not an interactive uh, challenger that just talks to an attacker in a black box way. So I, I don't know how to write any of these notch of exponents syntactically I see what you're as a game between a challenger and an attacker. The challenger is just sending some charge yeah, and the yeah, attacker is yeah, responding. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, yeah, and in fact, you can think about this, this result as being, uh, being some, uh, giving you actually a separation between knowledge of exponent and all falsifiable assumptions now. So essentially it says not only is, is syntactically do we not know how to write knowledge of exponents as a falsifiable assumption, you can't show knowledge of exponents secure under any falsifiable assumption in a black box way. I don't think so, but... Uh, probably there's a much more tri simpler way to do it, but uh, indirectly we kind of kind of showed that as well. I don't think you can get arbitrary this one point on it. And, and, but the fuse yeah. is bilinear groups. Fuse is bilinear groups, correct. And the one more? I don't know. I don't know the exact answer. Okay. And so, what do these knowledge of exponent assumptions did? Or what, what form, or what was the shape of the form? Right? So for every algorithm that uh, you know, uh, the computes uh, DPL1, right? takes the input g to the x to the y, computes g to the x y, there is another algorithm that computes the discrete part, something like that. That's yeah. oh. given the coins and the description of the, of the attacker, then you right. can, it'll spit out the, the uh, so that's kind of the, I think it's like the, the, if the attacker produces an output of a certain form, right. 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 then he has to know the input as to it essentially, right? So it's kind of that you can, there's, there's an extractor that's seeing this algorithm and so, output produces it. So I'm just trying to see in terms of point. So you're saying if there is a universal extractor, right? Um, what does that the mean? The problem is, it's, I think in this case it's hard. It's, it's like you can, you, you need, uh, it won't, it doesn't work right because there's not enough stuff to even 
give it, right? You right. can't just give it the transcript of the run the adversary A. It's like right. clear that this doesn't exist. Like you, can, you can then show this is a falsified assumption, I guess. Uh, it, it doesn't hold. So I guess it, it has to be some other handle on, on what the, the attacker is doing. Right, I mean, the extractor there, it's important that he gets to see the, the random coins and the, the, the code of the attacker. Yeah. Because I think the thing is, because if you had such a universe extractor, you just break the screen. You just break it. Yeah, it's a great thing. Or break the screen. Some access to the field one or So it's a reduction between yeah. the screen log and the field. Yeah. Which, yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Which is interesting. Okay. Yeah, these are weird assumptions. So I'm wondering if you yourself said, so, so assume that this dark growth was constructed under the simple uh, knowledge of exponent assumption. Mm -hmm. Would your negative results then say that there is no reduction between uh, the Fielman and the uh, uh, next table? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, that, that is... So without the universal extracting regular, the regular ordering of the thing. Okay, and um, so the next thing is that uh, there's a couple of other questions. So maybe you could get arguments that are succinct in the witness size, but not the statement size. So I think that would be probably in practice that would be very useful already. Um, and uh, this result doesn't rule that out. So that would be really interesting. This result requires that, uh, that, that the argument size is, 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 is really polyalgorithmic in the instance as well. So wait, so the growth result, is it uh, polylog, is it sub it's sublinear in the statement size or just the witness size? I think it's the statement size as well. I'm not totally sure. Yeah, in both. Um, and the last thing is, uh, what about constructions of two or three round arguments uh, rather than, you know, with static soundness? Um, so can you get these or do the black box uh, separations extend? So the main stumbling block, block yeah, exactly, is the re that if you have a, a, a two round argument, so with, with static soundness, the tech of first chooses the statement, you get to send a CRS and he gives you, he should be able to give you a valid proof. So you can rewind for the same statement, you can get many proofs and... So you have to show how the rest of the you have to be able to be Mm-hmm. And exactly, our thing breaks down um, in that in that case. All right. Uh, okay. Thanks, Daniel. Good. We don't want to force him to like, write down the definition of yeah, the Bible yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, so what what is the best? Uh, is your guys' paper now the best uh, write-up of uh, falsifiable assumption definition? We made up a new definition for Moni's assumption yeah. because he was Moni yeah. was trying to um, actually even talk about differences in kind of standard assumption like RSA and discrete log, and there are there are more minor differences uh, uh, that you could talk about yeah. where one assumption is more falsifiable than other. So we gave a much broader definition because that's what we care about. We wanted to just have a broad broad separation, that's the best for us. So for example, Moni stuff I think didn't talk about interactive games and things like that. And in some sense those assumptions are less believable, right, than non-interactive ones. Or but less false so right assumptions following up Moni's um, I don't know about that. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah.